official records, maps, images, newspapers, other publications, a very broad category. And then we're just going to dip our toe into social history as well. So what I decided to do for the purpose of this evening was just choose a sample building so that I can show some of these websites using one building because we're talking about um, the positively 8th Street Festival. I chose 11 West 8th Street. I didn't do any research on the building before I chose it, so we'll find what we find. But I, I was very purposeful in choosing a building that is the 20th century. Um, the resources that we'll go through, you can certainly use for the 19th century, and I use them all the time when I research early 19th century architecture. But for some of them, the um, 20th century is where you're going to find the bulk of the information. So in order to show you those sites, I decided to choose a 20th century building. So this is 11 West 8th Street. Okay, so designation reports, which is a great place to start and where I usually start. And I will just briefly talk about these. So if anyone needs to scribble, you can scribble. So this is the Neighborhood Preservation Center, the Landmarks Preservation Commission, GDSHP, and then um, CRIS, which is the New York State website. So you are very fortunate in Greenwich Village, and I will not make the mistake, I don't know where Ted is, that number that we had. So we had 22021. So we enter our Department of Buildings number and our year. You could also, for instance, now that we know Martha Building Corp was the owner, if you wanted to see how many buildings did they file permits for, you could do that. If you knew who the architect was, you could go back and see, okay, how many permits within a certain year time span did he, he or she file? Um, but we're going to look for the um, new building, the building permit. So we enter that, and magically, we have just a ton of information. So it shows us, again, that construction permit date. Um, it will usually show an architect. So now we have, at the time of filing, Charles B. Myers is listed as the architect. It again will show that owner, so it's confirmation that the owner we saw in the CFO is the owner at the time of filing. It will give a little bit of a description. So again, it's that six-story apartment building. And then also an estimated cost of construction. So in a short amount of time, you really are, were able to flesh out what was in the designation report for this building. And again, just making notes, copying everything, writing everything down to help with the next phase of research. Going back to that Do It page where we had that drop-down list where we saw the building profile, you can also get to the tax and property records, which are basically, did they have a mortgage? You know, that kind of information is actually all online. So you click on that, it will bring you to the city finance department system. I will say for most buildings, it's not going to go back significantly far. Um, I've seen ranges, I've seen things go back in the 20s. For this particular building, it only went back as far as 1969. And what it did have is the notice of the designation and what tax blocks that designation was going to impact. But the great thing is if you do find a record, there are PDFs. You can click and open it up and see what it's going to tell you. Okay, we made it through the really heavy stuff. Um, now we get to go to the fun visuals. So we've got um, maps, and there are so many resources out there. And I'm showing, I think every researcher, right, we have our own prejudices or we like to work on certain systems better than others. Um, so sometimes it's just a very personal thing. Um, or if you're working in a particular neighborhood, one resource is going to be better than the others. Um, but we're really fortunate in New York that we have so much digitized. So Museum of the City of New York, the New York Public Library, the Library of Congress, which is a personal favorite of mine, and David Rumsey. And David Rumsey, it, maybe it's one of the lesser known among the general public, but it's really amazing. It has over 100,000 digitized maps from all over the world. They've been digitizing since the 1990s. Um, you can, you can um, create a username. There's no fee. But if you create a username, you can download pretty high resolution versions of these maps. Um, or you can just even zoom in on them on the screen, which is really fabulous because maps, sometimes you need to get that level of detail of what's right around Washington Square. Um, so at the bottom of the page, you just go to you know, launch the collection, 
in the Luna browser. And I just, you know, generically searched Manhattan, and these are all the great maps that popped up. I mean, the VLA map, I won't even go into it, but that's a pretty fabulous one. Um, just tons of, of great maps. You can further narrow it down. So if you search for Manhattan and you realize, eh, I'm really only interested in the 1870s, you can narrow it down. If you're only interested in maps made by Bromley, you can narrow that down. Um, so for instance, this is one I use quite frequently from that website. This is the Matthew Drips map from 1852. Um, so there is our future building site, but maps like this, even if they're pre your construction date, it gives you a sense of what was happening in the neighborhood. You know, this building, this wasn't a vast wasteland when this building was built in, in 1921. Um, there were other things that were there, other things that it replaced. Um, it can also give you some interesting details about um, street names. Street names do change. Um, so part of 8th Street was known as Clinton Place for a while. Um, I will say that maps, um, you know, this was published in 1852, but it might reflect a slightly earlier time by the time it's published, but they're just, they're wonderful resources. The other that I just want to go through quickly is the Library of Congress. Um, and I encourage you, like it's such an amazing resource and they do have a map section. And you can, again, you can limit by, I think I just clicked specific years. Um, and again, enter the search term, and it pulls up all of these maps. And unfortunately, it doesn't give you a ton of information about the date when you see the snippet view. So this is where the hours suddenly on your sofa appear, because they all sound fascinating, and you just start clicking into all of them. Um, but if you pull one up, it'll give you basic information about rights and reproductions. They also, much like David Rumsey, for most things, you can download them, and you can download a pretty decent resolution, or again, you can zoom in on the website as well. Um, so this is one of my favorites for, um, from the Library of Congress, and this is a bird's eye view of Manhattan in 1879. It's a little artistic license, right? But it's really fabulous. So there again is our little area awaiting construction. We've got, um, I love this, Jefferson Market Courthouse there. Um, so this great little bird's eye view of what the area looks like. And this is a massive map, and I'm able to zoom in on this level of detail. It's a really great resource. And then New York Public Library, you've probably used New York Public Library's maps a lot. I just want to mention that they do a really great job of putting information about how to use their collection online. So they have a whole page about, yes, we have maps. Yes, we have New York maps. Here's how to find them. So it's really worth some time just reading through it because they've been very thoughtful about what they think people are really looking for. Um, so that's a great resource. Images, which tends to be the most fun, right? Um, again, we've got um, tons of great resources. New York institutions have been just doing an amazing job of digitizing things and increasing the public access. Um, to the collections, which is great as a researcher, it, to be able to access some of these um, files. So we've got the Museum of the City of New York, that's where this wonderful B. Dalton image came from, um, the New York Public Library, the Municipal Archives, the Library of Congress again, and this one I threw in specifically for Greenwich Village, which is the digital culture of metropolitan New York, and we'll talk about that one. Um, so MCNY, it's one of my favorites. It's a pretty easy search engine, and they have just, they're continually adding items. So you can just enter your search term, um, and it will pull up some images. Um, the one thing that I will say is that, you know, databases are always tricky, and you can't predict what might pull up a result. So for instance, for this search, I looked for 8th Street. I didn't find really what I wanted to. I found this great image of 3 West 8th Street, which is really lovely, but I didn't find anything right on target for me. So what I did is I went down to their keywords, which take advantage whenever you see keywords um, on a database, it means that's how they've keyed images. So it may not be how you would think of the image, but it's how they think of the image. So by just clicking on 8th Street, even though I had already searched 8th Street, I found this fabulous image, which is indeed um, showing demolition on our site. So this shows, this is um, 17, so this is 15, and then it would be 13 and 11 being demolished 
for the construction of our building. So you can come up with um, great things like that. So there again, that's, and this helps again to kind of say, okay, our, you know, our CFO was 1922, the building permit was 1921, here's an image that is supposedly from June, this is all syncing up as far as the construction date. Um, this is a brand new one, kind of within the last month, and I don't know, if it's been getting a lot of, you know, tweets and stuff, a lot of people publicizing it, which is great. This is um, a volunteer for the New York Public Library did this. He mapped every historic image of New York in their collection. So for me, what's great about this is it gives you two ways to search their collection. You could search from their digital gallery, which is really fabulous. You can also search this way, and I find I come up with different things. Again, it's just a matter of search terms and how things are keyed. So on this site, it's, and it's all five boroughs, so on this site, what you want to do is just click a little button that seems to be as close to your site um, as possible. So I clicked some things that were on 8th Street. And then what it does is it pulls up images that are either on 8th Street, this is 46 to 62 West 8th Street, and then also some things that maybe like a view of McDougal looking towards 8th Street, you know, things that are kind of associated with that view. So this just went up last month, I believe, and they're still, you know, adding information, especially some of the, um, this information. And you can actually, as a volunteer, I've done this a few times, just go ahead and add, like just transcribe some of the New York public stuff right into the system. Um, so they have that. The great thing is if you find an image you like, it will key you back to New York public. So then you have the benefit of all of their information as well. So what, what are the copyright issues? Because again, we want to respect all of the archives. They've done so much work. We want to respect their copyright, properly credit them. Um, and it gives you, you know, if you need the image number, if you want to get a print, it gives you all that information. Um, and in this instance, I found this is very similar to the 1970s view that we saw. This is, again, West A Street from 6th Avenue, but this is 1935. So there's just a wealth of images out there. This one, um, the Digital Culture of Metropolitan New York, this is put together by librarians, and it's really a, um, an aggregate of a lot of different collections. And what's interesting is it's a lot of smaller collections, so there's the whole list of places that it pulls from. And I thought, and for Greenwich Village, this comes in very handy. It has the Sailor Snug Harbor archives, it has the Whitney archives, which pulls up a lot of information actually about 8th Street. Um, so it just has some like quirky archives that you can certainly go to directly, but this is just a great starting point to see, do any of these maybe have something that might be of help for me? So again, I just did a really simple you know, Greenwich Village search, and I came up with a bunch of options. And it's not only images, it's um, newspaper articles. So this is from the scrapbook of Sailor Snow Harbor, and it, it deals with um, the builders of the Brevort. Um, and you know, talks, and it's a villager clipping, maps, and photographs. So it's just a great kind of quirky source that I find useful for Greenwich Village. Newspapers. This one, this is the area where it gets a little trickier. There are absolutely sources for you to search from the comfort of your own home. But you will find more by leaving your home and going to an institution. Because a lot of the databases for newspapers um, are subscription only. And a lot of it also has to deal with copyright. So a lot of what you'll find for free out there is going to be pre-1922 or 1923 right now. So that might very well be all you need, but if you need to go beyond that, you um, might need to go elsewhere. So we're going to go through a couple of Library of Congress, again, Old Fulton, um, the New York Times, which if you have a subs digital subscription, you can get that, or you can go to the New York Public Library. Early American Newspapers, which is a great database I use all the time for the village because it's 18th and early 19th century newspapers. And again, you have to go in person to the New York Public Library or have a membership to an organization that supplies that. And then ProQuest, which is another database that libraries and institutions tend to subscribe to. And I have here University Alumni Access. Um, if you have a, if you are an alum of a university, it's definitely worth checking if they provide access to any of these resources. 
Columbia through Columbia, I can sit at home and access certain databases, JSTOR, a little bit of ProQuest, and that's free. That's just free to their alumni. So it's worth checking to see if you're able to get that. So I just want to put that little plug in there. Um, and then I just wanted to make a mention, we've talked about this a little bit, but about search terms and about what you put in may not match how the database thinks. And so particularly for newspapers, I find I just have to try everything. Sometimes it makes a difference. Like if it's St. Mark's and you put a period after the T and they don't, nothing might come up. So it's just a matter of just trying all those different terms and seeing what's worked. So that's kind of, you know, these are just a few examples of the kind of terms that you can use. Um, so Old Fulton, which if you can tell from the home page, is a slightly wacky and entertaining site. Um, you have to ignore some of the um, interesting graphics <laughs> going on here. But it is, um, I'm not quite sure how to describe it. It's basically people just ignoring copyright and scanning whatever they want and putting it online. <coughs> so they have, um, look at that number, if you can read it, it's like 30 million or something. It's an insane number. And while it's called, you know, Old Fulton, New York, they actually have newspapers from all over. And the great thing is they <coughs> tend to have, you know, like the, you know, your local little, like the Poughkeepsie, whatever, or the Kansas Bee, and they just, and they have a lot of more local newspapers. Um, so like the others, you enter search terms. In this instance, I entered revort court in quotation marks from the designation report. We know that was supposedly the name of the building. And it pulled up all these options for me. I will say because this is volunteer driven and they are scanning, they don't always make sure that at the top of the image, it tells you what newspaper it is or when it was printed. So it's not always great. The, um, the image file usually has a name, but sometimes it'll just be between years. But again, if you at least know the article exists, and maybe you can backtrack through other sources and try to find it. So in this instance, it pulls up this fabulous little ad for our building. So it shows a 1923 ad for um, three and four room apartments in an elevator building. And that's the kind of thing that I find on there a lot, are ads, quirky articles about architects, when, when you get into the social history aspect, if you're re researching a person, this can really be helpful for that. Um, New York Public Library. Again, these are databases that you really have to go to in person, but online they have a great um, search system to find your database. And then once you find it, it will tell you, okay, here's what you need to do. So I entered America's Historical Newspapers, the one that I mentioned that I use a lot, and it tells you here where you can go to access it. So you can go to the research libraries, but for this one, actually all the branch libraries have it. So you could just wander over to Jefferson Market, you know, deal with the lovely staff there, and use that database. Um, and it's very helpful. And like I said, you can just go there and find all the different databases that you want that they offer. And this is just to show you an example. This is what that database looks like, the one that I use a lot for Greenwich Village history. Um, I access it from home um, through the New York Genealogical Bibliographical Society, but I often have to go to the library because not everybody has the same amount of information. So you can, you can search by custom date, by location, all these different options for searching. Um, then the Library of Congress, which is really great because it tends to have for New York newspapers like the Sun and the Herald Tribune which are much harder to find in other places you can obviously go to the New York Times website and you know find the articles in the New York Times but for the Sun and the Herald Tribune it can be a little harder um, this does have just the dates to 1922 so the Library of Congress is obviously honoring copyright um, but you can again you can use search terms I just looked at Charles Myers and came up with a ton of results um, and including an article that talks about another um, building that he was going to be designing. So that's the kind of stuff you can find. Library of Congress, I have a lot of luck for um, early 20th century building ads. So great detailed advertisements for an apartment hotel and you know all sorts of details. So it's, it's a great site for that. Other publications. 
this is a very broad category. Um, but I wanted to, particularly for Greenwich Village, there are so many great publications out there from the early 20th century um, that you can go through. And these are just a few of the sources. So for books, um, the Internet Archive, um, Google Books, you're probably all familiar with. For architecture, um, a few that you may not consider, which is the AIA, the Real Estate Record Guide, the New York Real Estate Brochures. I won't have time to go into that one, but it's really fabulous. If you have a 20th century apartment building, it's the original you know, brochures that maybe the architect or owner produced. So it'll show floor plans. Um, it just it will have the speak, you know, how they're trying to sell the building at that time. Um, and I did pull up quite a few for Greenwich Village, so it's worth a look. Um, manuscripts, of course, most of them you can't view online, but you can at least, at least look through their database and see what they have. So New York Historical is a fabulous resource um, and New York University. And then scholarly articles, um, and JSTOR is a great one for that. So if a Greenwich Village scholar wrote a paper in architectural record or something like that, you'll be able to pull that up from JSTOR. So we'll start with um, the Internet Archive or archive.org. And I don't know if you've used this before, but I vastly prefer it to Google Books. It's just, um, they overlap a lot. So I use both, but I tend, if something's available through here, I default to here just because um, it has a really nice interface. It's easy to read things online. Um, and it also is not just books, but it's a lot of different mediums. So again, I entered, I just entered Greenwich Village and it pulled up, this is where I started to get in trouble because I wanted to watch all 48 movies that it listed, right? Like it, so it's collections, it's audio, so it might be oral histories, it's movies, I did watch a couple of these, which were really great. Um, text, images, concerts, I didn't check to see what that is, that could be kind of interesting, and software. Um, so if we choose one, and I particularly love all, this, all the books they have, um, and we put some on the resource sheet. So a lot of Greenwich Village guides from the early 20th century, which are so fabulous, you can find here. Um, as well as some of the early histories of Greenwich Village you'll be able to find here. And this is kind of the read online interface, which is really nice because you can pretend that you're just flipping through a book. So these little arrows here will just flip the pages for you and you can just read it online. You can also, for the most part, download everything unless there's a copyright um, issue from the institution. You can download a lot of stuff. Um, and then you can also search within that book. It's not perfect, but it's a great little tool. And so what it will do is it will pull up all these tiny little tabs, all these little bookmarks, wherever your search term has appeared. And then if you click on it, it will give you a little synopsis. And you can decide whether you want to look at it or not. So in this instance, it was intriguing. It's a restaurant. Um, and we've got what it ends up pulling up is this great description of a restaurant at 19 West A Street. So on the same block as our building before it was constructed, and also a ton of other restaurants and businesses on the street at that time. And it creates this fabulous little window, especially if you're doing social history. What did it look like? Who was in business? How long did these survive? Um, and they're just very, very charming. So this is the little book of Greenwich Village from 1918. Um, Columbia University has the Real Estate Record Guide, so for architectural um, research this is very key. You can um, search again a specific um, search term. It starts at 1868 and ends in 1922, so I put in 1920 to 22, and it will pull up whatever it finds. And the one thing they really have a lot of here are conveyance or deed records. So in this instance, it pulled up the record of the purchase of those lots by Martha Building Corporation. So it says that in March 11 of 1920, that company bought those lots from this person. Um, and this is a great thing to have. You might want to go when you're ready, go and confirm that that's actually true, because this is a publication. It can get things wrong. But again, it's a good starting point for that kind of information. And that's what you tend to find in the record and guide, that kind of information, information on architects and buildings that are projected. 
um, the AIA Historical Directory, which is one you may not think of, but particularly in Greenwich Village, you have some really significant architects who worked in the village, many of them who would have been members of the AIA in the 19th and 20th century, and they have a great online resource. So you can just, they have lots of different ways to search. I searched just by name, I just went to the C, the M section, sorry, the M section, and what I pulled up was an a form that actually the architect, Charles Myers, filled out for the AIA. So it lists, you know, when did he start practice, um, where did he go to school, what are some of his other buildings. He does not identify our building as one of his prime examples, which I'm not surprised by. But, um, it, you know, it gives you all sorts of information. And again, it's filled out by him, so that's a great primary resource. Social history, we're just going to quickly um, run through. I feel like need to bring it up because no building is complete without talking about the people who actually inhabited it. <coughs> um, buildings are built for people. Um, but again, these resources, you could just do an entire lecture just on these and how to interpret them and how to find them. And a lot of them you need to go to a repository or a, a database at a repository in order to find them. Um, so census records, which are amazing, New York City directories, there are a ton of them online, which is great. So archive.org, again, has a ton of them. And then just manuscript finding aids that will give you, you know, if you find someone in the census records, looking them up at one of the repositories and see if there are any letters or diaries. So here's what a, a census search looks like. Um, this is the latest, 1940 was released, so we can now go up to 1940. And for our building, it will list everybody who resided there in 1940 with um, where they were born, what do they do, um, how many people, you know, list, fortunately for the later years, it lists everyone within their household. So when I was looking at this, I'm seeing artists, I'm seeing a lot of teachers, um, I saw a music critic, a chemist, all sorts of interesting things. You can then take those names and look and see if you find them in a New York City directory. So the 1922 directory is online, and what is great is people are also now digitizing um, phone books. So this is the 1946 phone book that you can access through archive.org. This one takes a long time to search through, um, but it's very fun and well worth the effort. So just, um, you can easily kind of hop skip from one to the other. Um, so the info that we kind of uncovered in our building, just kind of go through it. We kind of narrowed down a construction date. We identified a possible architect. We identified some of the other work of that architect so we can look and see if there's any relation to our building. Does it make any sense? And the owner at the time of construction, and that didn't really, in the scheme of things, take that long to find that information because we're not including all my side searches and tangents that I went through when I was looking through all this. Um, so just some final tips that I want to go through. Um, these, this is obviously, this isn't everything. There's a lot more out there. Um, but use the MPC resource sheet, go to Positively Eighth and ask your questions about your building. Um, the New York Public Library, we have a, I think we have an entry on the resource sheet. They have a fabulous guide to how to research your neighborhood and how to research your New York City building, which is really great. Um, use the GDSHP resources. You're in a neighborhood that has all these fabulous resources, and you can have easy access to those. Track, or be skeptical, that's just my big one. I'm skeptical about everything I find until I can kind of track it back and find a resource, which means track information and where you find it. So if you run across a crazy fact, you know where you found it, and you can see if you can find out if it's true or not, or if you just have to say, well, legend has it, or something like that. Um, gather as many primary sources, so things that were written at the time, like that AIA thing that the architect wrote himself. That gives you great information. And then just step away from the computer. Occasionally get some you know, blood running in your legs. And that is it. I, good luck with your resource. Research. Thank you. Yeah, I, do we have time? I have no concept of the time. I saw a wave, and I, just, I think that meant, go <laughs> <laughs>